Let's talk a bit about, well, I, will talk, I would like to talk a bit about the future of Java and, and the JDK. What is the future of the Java platform and the JDK? What is the technical roadmap, both short-term and long-term? A question that's been on many people's minds. Before we get to what is in the roadmap, um, I'm going to pull the same trick that John did yesterday and go meta. And I'm gonna go meta by trying to answer uh, this question that's also on the minds of many. Who gets to decide what goes in the roadmap? Who guides the development of the platform? Or perhaps most bluntly, who's in charge? As is so often the case to answer a difficult question, it can help to look at the past. Java is just over 23 years old. That's middle age or maybe late middle age for a programming platform. It's been declared dead on multiple occasions. Uh, it's been accused of being in maintenance mode or, oh, it's just the COBOL of the 21st century. Well, actually, COBOL's still being used quite a lot, so maybe that's not such a bad, such a bad thing. Uh, but at any, at any rate, it's still one of the most popular programming platforms in the world. Now, ranking programming platforms is a business that's fraught with difficulty. One of the more believable rankings is, uh, is from our, the folks at Redmonk. Um, this is their report for the first quarter of 2018. And it's pretty interesting the way they do this. So the, the x-axis is the popularity rank of a platform on GitHub. And the y-axis is its popularity rank on Stack Overflow. So the higher the higher the rank of a platform, you know, the more it's going to be in the upper right, right hand corner. And happily, you know, there is Java way up there in the up, upper right hand corner. Corner, um, you know, for mysterious reasons, one also sees JavaScript, but yeah, whatever, there it is. Uh, so Java's there, it's been there for a good long time. How, how did Java attain this status? And what should we do to keep it there? What's the secret? Well, the secret is that we've always taken the time to think about the big picture and the long term. We don't act only as developers, that is, people who create things. We also try to act as stewards. That is, we try to be responsible for, some, for overseeing and protecting something that's considered worth caring for and preserving. We try to preserve the past while evolving for the future. Now, a steward, by contrast to a developer in this case, is someone who's not only interested in writing code and designing new features, but one who has also demonstrated three key qualities. One is deep knowledge in at least one area. Another is a breadth of care across the platform. If you're only interested in one area, I mean, to, to, to really th you know, think like a steward, you need to th think from time to time about the entire platform, how the whole thing fits together even if you don't understand every part in complete depth. And finally, and this is a skill that, you know, is tough for a lot of people in our line of work, a certain amount of empathy. Uh, the ability to, to, to put themselves in the mind of an ordinary developer uh, who uses the platform rather than works on the platform. In many cases, that is a very different mindset. Now, our stewardship of the platform has always been guided by two key values, readability, and compatibility. Graham Hamilton elucidated these uh, back in 2005. About readability, he made three main points. One is reading is more important than writing. Another, simplicity matters. And a third, Java should be one language with the same meaning everywhere. He, here he, he, was, he was writing about the language, but this applies equally well to the entire platform. Why, why is readability so important? Well, readability is essential to maintainability. Java has never been about write-only, throw-away code. It's been about building large, reliable programs, programs that are efficient and that, that can be maintained over a long period of time. A more condensed statement of this idea, which I've always liked, is uh, due to Abelson and Sussman of MIT. Programs are meant to be read by humans and oh, only incidentally for computers to execute. Hamilton also discussed compatibility with respect to evolution. We will evolve the Java language platform, but cautiously and with a long-term view. We want it to be around in 2030 or 2040, 2050. We will add a few selected features periodically, uh, but we will try to preserve clarity and simplicity. 
So just as there are several aspects of readability, there are several aspects of compatibility. There's the familiar trio of source and binary and behavioral compatibility. You know, source, we all know source compatibility means existing code continues to compile. Uh, yeah, binary compatibility means existing code continues to link at runtime. Behavioral compatibility means existing APIs continue to behave the way they used to, or at least within, uh, within bounds of their specifications. There are at least two other kinds of compatibility that I think are, are really critical to the success of Java. One is what has come to be called, I, although I don't think this is the ideal name, but it's come to be called migration compatibility. Migration compatibility means that you can adopt a new feature incrementally. You don't have to have a flag day for a big new change. Uh, you, can, you can do things sort of, sort of piecemeal without migrating all of the code that you use in one shot. We first pulled this trick with generics and it worked out reasonably well. We did it again with lambdas and then with modules. The comp there's another kind of compatibility and, and I think it's, it's probably the most important, uh, most important one of them all and that's what I'll call intellectual compatibility. New features build on existing knowledge rather than destroy it. Millions of developers have invested countless hours learning the Java platform and we don't want to throw all those hours away as the platform evolves. To preserve that investment, we must carefully balance conservation and innovation. We have to respect the past, but not be unduly constrained by it. We will add selected new features, but we must strive to make them look like they've been there all along. This is a constant balancing act. Most of all, we must have the guts to say no, to follow some of the best advice ever from James Gosling. We must have the courage to do no thing rather than the wrong thing. So readability, compatibility, preserving these values while moving the platform forward is much, much, much harder than it looks. Many developers just don't care for this type of work and so we draw the distinction between developers and steward. Being a developer is fun. It's great, you get to build things, sometimes even from scratch. Um, I love writing code. It's probably why many of us got into this line of work in the first place. And of course, working on Java itself as a developer can be even more rewarding because, because hey, you're writing code that's used by millions and millions of developers around the world to write code that runs every day. In some cases, you know, code that runs extraordinarily large and, and complex systems. Yet some of us also find it incredibly reward rewarding also to act as stewards thinking about the big picture over the long term and working to balance conservation with innovation. With this history in mind, let's go back to the question, who is in charge? Who is in charge of the future of the Java platform and the JDK? Is that future directed by the Java SE expert group in the Java community process? No, it's not. The role of the Java SE expert group and the JCP more generally, is not to innovate, but rather to guard the integrity of the platform specification by ensuring that the reference implementation satisfies the specification and that the specification can be independently implemented. This is a role that's more, it's more a role of advice and consent uh, as the US Senate, well, at least was intended to play uh, with respect to the ratification of treaties and, and certain public officials. So if it's not the JCP, is the future of the platform directed by Oracle, or Red Hat, SAP, Google, Intel, IBM, and other large companies, you know, meeting in some secret room somewhere? No, it's not. The OpenJDK community isn't about companies. It's about developers. The very first sentence of our founding document, the OpenJDK bylaws, makes this plain. The OpenJDK community is an association of developers who collaborate upon open source implementations of present and future versions of the Java Platform Standard Edition. Now, most developers who work in the OpenJDK community full-time today are employed by a company, and most of the, many of those, the majority of those, are employed by Oracle. This does give Oracle the company a lot of indirect influence, but it does not give Oracle the company direct control. Some other long-term contributors are employed by other companies, such as Red Hat. Um, and we'd be thrilled 
if yet more companies were to step up to the plate and fund developers committed to working here for the long haul. Okay, so if the OpenJDK community is about developers rather than companies, then is the future of the platform directed by all the committers in some purely democratic fashion? No, it's not. Recall the key distinction, developer versus steward. <clears throat> not all developers are interested in acting as stewards. Some positively hate the idea, and that's okay. Not everybody has to be a steward. If, everybody, every, if we had you know, all chefs and no cooks, then nothing would actually get done. So we need, we need a good mix of the two, and, and you know, people who, who just want to act as developers are totally welcome. They do essential and important work. But in this distinction rests the answer to our question. Who is in charge? The stewards are in charge. Who are these stewards? This mysterious group of people. Who chooses them and who leads them? Well, I do. The formal name of my role in the OpenJDK community is OpenJDK Lee, but maybe it really should be head steward. I've been working on the JDK for almost exactly 22 years now. In that time, I've contributed a few things, large and small. Uh, in that time, I've also made mistakes, large and small, and I've seen plenty of other people make mistakes. Um, I've tried to learn from those mistakes, having seen the long-term consequences of many of them. I care deeply about the future of the platform, and even after 22 years, I find it a thrill to ship each new release. Heck, and now that's every six months, even better, right? I also, for, you know, for whatever it's worth, seem to have a high, higher tolerance than many for defining processes that other developers are willing to put up with. And this goes all the way back to my days at Sun Microsystems, where I was so frustrated by the existing processes, or, or lack thereof, in some ways, that I decided to try to improve them. Here, so here I am. Now, it's impossible, of course, for any single person to steward the entire Java platform and the JDK all by themselves. Java's grown into this rich language and platform, and so the JDK has grown into a large and complex system. Nobody can hope to understand all of that uh, in expert level detail. So I rely on other people, uh, and in many cases delegate to them, uh, other people who find some reward and even occasional joy in acting as stewards. Uh, in particular amongst those are John Rose, and Brian Getz. John Rose for the Java Virtual Machine, and Brian Getz for the language and libraries. John is one of the few people who've been working on Java for longer than I have. When did you start, John? 1995. Yeah, so, so I, I started in 96. Brian's a relative newcomer. Um, he joined the Oracle's Java team uh, a mere 12 years ago, uh, but he did contribute to the platform uh, prior to that. Now, many other contributors in the OpenJDK community help with stewardship as part of their day-to-day -day work uh, to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, many of you who do that to a greater degree are here in this room, so I'm glad you could make it. Some stewards don't work for Oracle, such as Andrew Haley of Red Hat. Some stewards don't work even for a company, such as Doug Lee of SUNY Oswego. Whoever they are, every one of them has demonstrated a deep, long-term track record of expertise in at least one area combined with a breadth of care for the entire platform and the ability to empathize with ordinary developers. So the future of the platform is in the hands of the stewards who constantly strive to balance conservation and innovation so as to maintain Java's core values of readability and compatibility. How do we do that? Well, there's no formal process for it. Much of it involves quiet, solitary thinking, uh, sometimes for months or even years before a germ of, a, of an idea is, is suitable for, even for discussion with anyone else. Much of it involves informal personal interaction on phone and video calls at conferences and on mailing lists. Much of it, for better or for worse, happens within Oracle's walls. And while that's natural, since many of the stewards work for Oracle, it's also a bug because it makes it harder for non-Oracle stewards to participate. Uh, and that's a big reason why we're having this meeting here today and tomorrow, and while, why we will probably have future meetings of this nature going forward. 
The fruits of these discussions surface in two primary ways for others to see and then influence. One is as new JEPs in the JEP process, and the other for larger efforts is in the form of new OpenJDK projects, which explore a problem area in depth, sometimes for years, and eventually generate one or more JEPs that eventually wind up uh, as actual features in a platform release. Now, maintaining the technical roadmap and doing all the other jobs of a steward, especially head steward, inevitably involves making decisions. When I make a decision, I consult with other stewards and reviewers and committers and try my best to build consensus amongst the parties involved if needed. And if I'm party to a decision, then I recuse myself and delegate to someone else. Sometimes I've been unable to find consensus and had to make a decision that left some people unhappy. unhappy. Fortunately, this has been rare. I encourage everyone else in any kind of decision-making role in this community to act in a like manner. If you don't like a decision that someone makes, then you're free to appeal it. If, for example, you don't like a de decision that Vladimir makes about the VM, then you can appeal it to John. And if you don't like John's decision, then you can appeal it to me. Um, but, well, hmm, what if you don't like a decision that I make? Well, I'm, I'm not a benevolent dictator. I try to be benevolent, but I'm not a benevolent dictator as some other open source communities have, or in some cases used to have. Um, if you really strongly, violently disagree with a decision that I make and you can't convince me to change my mind, then you're free to appeal to the OpenJDK governing board. Since 2011, when the current bylaws were ratified, no one has seen the need to make such an appeal. Okay, so you might be wondering, if you're not a steward, maybe you don't even work on the JDK, how can you influence the future of the platform? Just as in any other healthy open source community, the first rule is that you have to show up. Every one of you in this room, every participant on every OpenJDK mailing list, every individual on the internet even, whether employed by a large company or not, has the opportunity to influence the direction of the platform. That degree of influence is determined by the extent to which you show up and contribute here in the OpenJDK community on a meaningful, ongoing basis. A good bug report, that, that'll get you some influence. Many good bug reports are better. A constructive critique, not just a drive-by shooting, but a constructive critique of a proposal, that, that, that's good. Many such critiques are better. A bug fix is good. Many bug fixes are better. You see the pattern here? A small enhancement, yeah, that, that, that'll count for a fair bit. Many small enhancements will count for more. An entire non-trivial jet, that, that's, that's quite good. Many such jets are even better. As you can see, what's important isn't just the quality and impact of any single contribution, but the, also the ongoing commitment over time as demonstrated by your actions, not your words, to improve the Java platform and the JDK. Your actions need motiva motivations, of course, and I, I wouldn't ask anyone to act uh, purely out of charity here, but if you only participate in order to serve you or your employer's narrow technical interests, then you're unlikely to gain much influence. If you only show up to play political games, blocking progress, wasting the time of other contributors in order to, to make you or your employer look good, you will have no influence at all. If you show up only to participate in bike shed discussions of language syntax, then eh, you might have a tiny bit of influence. If you show up with just a few narrowly focused patches that reduce your own technical debt, but eh, frankly aren't that much value to anyone else, then you're welcome, and you'll have little influence, but not much. If, however, you develop a strong track record of consistent, serious contributions over a long, period of time, then your influence will grow quite large. You might even become a steward yourself, so watch out. This will happen only if you or your employer see that your self-interest is best served by contributing in ways that are not obviously to your short-term benefit, but will help keep Java itself vibrant for the long term. 
The future of the platform is in the hands of the stewards. Anyone else can influence the future of the platform in proportion to de the de degree to which they show up and contribute, not just in the short term, but for the long haul. Is all this the way it should be? Maybe, maybe not. But history shows that it's worked very well for quite a while now. By taking stewardship seriously, we've managed during Java's 23 years so far to evolve the platform in ways both large and small while preserving its core values of readability and compatibility. When you look back and think about it, adding generics and lambdas and modules without syncing the platform were pretty impressive feats. Why did these and other features take so long? Was it due just to stubborn, stubborn obstruction or not invented here syndrome? Shouldn't adding these features have been relatively straightforward? I mean, other platforms have had them for years. Should be simple, right? The answer is that to add these features, we had to have the guts to take the time to iterate over and over and over to get them right, to make them fit, to preserve readability and compatibility. And that's what we will keep doing to move Java forward. Don't believe a word I've said. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>